we, we have more concealed weapon permit holders in Florida than any state by double, 1.2 million. And to get a gun permit, you have to take a, you have to, to take a test, you have to be trained, you have to have a background check, and you get your gun. The incidence of crime committed by law-abiding citizens is tiny. It, I mean, it's just it's way below um, the, the general population crime rate. And our crime rate has, for the people who commit crimes, excuse me, um, our crime rate has dropped because law-abiding citizens can defend themselves. And we have strong laws against people that use guns illegally uh, for violent purposes. So we've had, we've had 24 years, I think, of drops in gun violence, and we, we are a second in the state. We have concealed weapons permits, we have a waiting period, which I think is appropriate, but, but that will be decided by each state. I think the big challenge as it relates to these incidents of violence that are so tragic, to see people going to a movie theater or the recruiters in our, in our in Chattanooga. This is, this is heartbreaking to see these things. And now in the world where, where everything comes at us, you know, we see everything so visually now, uh, you can't ignore it. I think the one thing that is different today that, that we need to figure out what to do is uh, mental illness. We need to make sure that there's, there's, there's no problems with HIPAA laws, with privacy laws that makes this harder. But when people get off track, they end up doing bad things, either to themselves or to others. And I think as a society, we need to figure out a much better way to identify these trends before they get to the point where someone feels so, you know, so depressed that they commit, they kill themselves or suicide, or they go and kill, kill others. I, I, I don't, it's not an easy thing to do, but this is a place I think where we need to focus our attention. And, and I do think that if you have better data collection on these issues, where people are more open about it, that some of these cases people wouldn't have been able to get guns. Governor, we're going to go back to you. Thank you for coming today, Governor. I'm the recent graduate of Worcester High School, it's great public school. I'm proud to be a graduate and have a run. One thing I noticed during my time there was an extreme bias in some departments, a little bias. And the um, most common opinion, I think, that was held by students coming out of the high school was a very negative view of America, which I personally found to be very sad. As she said today, America is the greatest nation in the world, but I'm not I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I personally believe America is great, but I find it very sad that it's become a common opinion by the people um, coming out of many school districts in the area. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what you can say to those children. So, look, the, we have, we're up a big debate in the country about standards, and somehow they've been cooperated by the federal government. And I don't think the federal government should have any say about anything related to standards, which are the expectations that we have for kids and teachers, content, which is what we read, and actual information and curriculum, which is the strategy of taking the content to achieve the standards. That ought to be driven by state policy implemented at the local level. That's It's what I believe, and if I'm president, I would sign an executive order to make it an ironclad certainty that that was the case. I hope the Congress and the reauthorization of the K-12 law will do that. But here's the problem. No standards and crappy curriculum, excuse my bad language, is horrible. And the stuff that, I mean, I mentored a kid every Wednesday morning, eighth grade kid, during my eight years as governor. I was all in on the education thing, trust me. I mean, all in. And, you know, what you learn is that the, the priorities in social studies and history, the, the lack of rigor, the lack of uh, respect for our heritage is deep. It runs deep. It's not just here. It's across the country. And then wait till you go to college, my friend. I mean, it's over then. You better, you better be wearing your Kevlar as a conservative there because you have restrictions. You're going to be told that your beliefs are not allowed to be spoken. I mean, this is the world we're moving towards, and we need to challenge it across the board. Whenever you see.
these kinds of things. And I admire the fact that you would stand up for your own country, you know, at, at your high school. That's the right thing to do. But we need high standards with rigorous content to make sure that more than a third of our kids are college and or career ready. That's where we are. We spend more per student than any country in the world, most of which is local and state funded. The federal government pays a tiny part of this. And other than two or three, like Belgium, I think, and a couple other rounding errors in terms of their size, we spend that much money, more than any other place, and about a third of our kids are truly college and or career ready, which means they can actually go to college and start taking college level work. Now, we either going to dumb down college so that we match it, or we're going to raise our expectations for our high school kids. And here's what I know to be true. Children are stupid. They're not dumb. But if we dump down everything, they'll achieve what we expect of them. And so we need to not just deal with the, the uh, politically correct side of this, but we need, to make, we need to bring rigor back in math and English and science and history. It needs to be significantly higher. And in Florida, we did that. We put pressure on the system. We eliminated tenure for, for new teachers. We had the most ambitious school choice program.
automobile that has come before with the RAM. Um, we look at uh, you know, the, the atrocities happening in the Planned Parenthood and abortion, immigration, the list goes on and on. And you mentioned many of the things tonight. Last night in the debate, several of the folks got asked what are their priorities on the first day in office. As President of the United States, what will be your top priorities in that first day in office? Great question. I wish I was I, the, the, the debate was kind of crazy because you know, they didn't. So there were some really good questions I would love to ask, answer, and there were some questions I would prefer not to. <laughs> they would seem like an equal opportunity place in that regard. In any case, the first thing that we have to do, the first immediate thing that a president needs to do is rebuild a culture of a solutions-oriented culture. I mean, that's the, the first, and that should happen, that has to start before inauguration. You have to begin to make it possible to have people that don't agree to be able to have a dialogue, to build trust, to get things done. And this president got elected the last time on that very point. He didn't get elected by saying, vote for me, I'm going to be the most divisive, left-wing president in American history. He didn't get elected that way. He got elected, as you recall, by saying, there are no blue states, there are no red states, there are only United States, soaring eloquence about bringing us together. And he did the exact opposite. He jammed down the throats of Obamacare and the stimulus and Dodd-Frank, his three major accomplishments. And on foreign policy, we've now lost the bipartisan consensus that used to be the norm on foreign policy. And it, this has to change. This country will not function unless we rebuild the traditional way of solving problems. So that, that's the long-term strategy. As it relates to the personal, the per, the particular things, I'll give you a few. Appoint men and women immediately, as fast as you can, so having thought about this long before January, that have subject matter expertise on a wide array of subjects that really have a huge impact on our lives, most particularly on the regulatory side. Basically, the Obama administration is full of political hacks and academics. They have a very hard-edged political agenda rather than looking at it from a broader perspective of how do you create rules to protect the public good without destroying the economic benefits that are so essential for our long-term success. So that is hugely important to have men and women of talent that are not as political. I mean, right now the White House calls all the shots. Basically, they call up their, their buds inside of these departments and say, do what you're told. We need to get back to the business of actually governing effectively and competently. Secondly, the President of the United States has the opportunity to sign executive orders. Ted Cruz brought this up, and I think he made a really good point. There are many things that this president has done by executive order that can be done by the exact same way. That's part of the prerogative of being president, and I can do just that. Some of these will be ruled unconstitutional by the time the next president gets there, but there's a lot of things that can be done there. Thirdly, we need to re-engage with the rest of the world, where we have, we rebuild trust there too. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Let me, let me rephrase. Name a country in the world where the president, where our, where our relationship is better today than the day that Barack Obama got elected. Cuba, well done. <laughs> Cuba, nothing in return. Not a single thing in return. People are being imprisoned. Nothing, nothing changes. The desk is still, they're not going quietly in the night. I mean, granted, we legitimize the Castro regime with, uh, with diplomatic relations. And what's the other country? Name the countries in the world where our relationship is worse. We don't have enough time. But so the challenge of the next president, I think, is to restore the relationships that keep the world safe. Starting with Canada for crying out loud. We really rupture a relationship with Canada, our largest trading partner, a country, don't, don't tell them this, they'll get really upset that, that it's really similar to us. They don't like to hear that. Close neighbors in every way, and yet we have bad relations now. Israel, a huge linchpin as it relates to our security and certainly theirs. There are many other countries as well, and that is uniquely the responsibility of the of the president. And then on policy, working with Congress, I would say the lowest hanging fruit relates to an energy policy. We should be exporting oil. We should be expanding. Now
natural gas uh, production. There's a way to create a comprehensive strategy with an aspirational goal of energy security for North American resources in short order. Uh, I think we can get immigration reform done. If you're serious about securing the border, there's other things that we can do to help uh, fix our, our broken immigration system. So work on actually doing the job of president working with Congress would be the, the final point I would make. I think there's great opportunities there. Governor, we're going to come over to this side. And just be close. We got you. Yeah, that's why we're here. You're coming. Don't worry. Yeah. Now I'm going to take the mic away and make sure you get your the tradition continues. Hi, Governor. My name is Dave Rasher from Governor New Hampshire. And my concern is the national debt. At over $18.6 trillion, of which $1.3 trillion is owed to the Chinese, somehow the Democrats continue to be able to use social issues as their guiding light. And somehow they continue to get a, a great majority of people to rally around that guiding light. How do we as Republicans take 18, talk more about this number and what it's actually going to do to our country? in a very short order and get rid of all this social, I mean, social stuff's important, but this is what's real important, and it's right now. So here's, let me, let me ask you a question. How many questions were asked about the national debt last night? No, I just, it just don't me. I don't think there was a single question on these big, broad issues that have an impact on everybody. 320 million of us, because you're absolutely right. Here's, here's the deal. We have 18 plus trillion of debt. We've narrowed the, the maturities. We've shortened the maturities. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but trust me, if you're borrowing with a credit card, like a monthly credit card, it comes to every month. Instead of doing it for 30 years, like a mortgage, the federal government is shortening the maturities where the average, uh, I think more than 60% of the debt due comes due in five years. So we're, we're lowering the maturities to get 0% interest. So the debt service is lower today than it was 12 years ago. This is a ticking time bomb that has no pain in, in, in Washington. The political class would begin to look at this and take it seriously if, in fact, debt service crowded out all their protected programs. But it doesn't right now because of the low interest rate environment. And the Federal Reserve is now taken over by a long shot buying the debt from China because China's not buying our debt to the extent that they used to. They may renew some of it, but they're not. Why would you buy debt at 0% interest, you know, and we, we already got more than enough? So our own central bank, in fact, what we're saying is our, the next generation is buying the debt uh, for, to pay for the structural deficits of today. Here's what we need to do. We need to grow the economy. People think that I'm a broken record about this, but 4% growth generates far more revenue than any government program ever created. Donald Trump has proposed in the past a tax on assets, which is pretty radical, you know, 14% tax on assets. He's now abandoned that, so I'm not attacking anybody. But that idea, that's a fairly exotic form of taxation. Tax, basically, your wealth, 14%. If you did that, it doesn't come close to high sustained economic growth. Gen growth generates far more revenue for government than any other form of taxation. It is a much more organic way to be able for government to get its money. It means that government is growing, hopefully, less rapid than people's income. High growth matters. And so reforming our taxes and regulations, embracing the energy revolution, fixing immigration, that's part of the strategy. Second, we should challenge every form of spending because there's a lot of things government does that's really important. But I don't get a sense that they've gone through the budget like a governor has to. When you have a downturn in Florida, you have a balanced budget requirement. So you got to make choices. you got to make cuts. It's really hard to cut services for people that desperately need the help. We always try to find ways to avoid that by reforming it, by finding a way to spend less and do more, by making providers maybe pay less, get less of the, less of the, uh, the deal. We don't do that in Washington. There should be a thorough review of every program, and my guess is what you find is there's extraordinary waste, not just in the Defense Department. The Veterans Department just um, got appropriations, I believe, for uh, a billion dollar cost over to build a 
hospital. It started at 200, now then it went to 900, now it's 1.8 billion dollars for a hospital. I mean, come on. So on the discretionary spending side, you have to cut back. The only way to get to this debt problem is to move towards a balanced budget. And then finally, you have to deal with the entitlement issue that is going to be a ticking time bomb unless we change the, the out-year run rates. And there are simple things that we can do to save Social Security, preserve it for those that have it, by extending the retirement age over an extended period of time to make sure that it exists for the next generation. Because if we don't, if we just can't sail this path, we're not going to have it. And Medicare, the same principle applies. Move towards a more means-tested approach to Medicare and deal with uh, retirement ages in a more creative way that exists today. If you deal with entitlements and you lessen and you grow the economy, then the budget gets back in balance over an extended period of time. But right now, we're going the other direction. Uh, I would like to know if you think the Koch brothers are upset that recently you said that you would end federal fossil fuel subsidies. And I'd also like to know if you think that they would be supporting a different candidate for the nomination from that statement. Uh, I think they're, they're for eliminating oil subsidies, tax subsidies. So I'm not sure I hope, I hope to get their support out of uh, they're, they're libertarians. They think we ought to, they ought to, and I agree with this, I think we ought to eliminate all forms of subsidies and tax benefits for all forms of energy and let the market decide what the most effective energy source is. It works a lot better than the top-down approach. The government tried this with the venture capital arm that was funded by the stimulus. It didn't work out well, did it? Solyndra, I mean, almost every one of these deals is a loser. And I think you get more robust, rapid innovation where you have lower costs and greater benefits when, when companies are forced because of market pressures to disrupt, to find lower costs and generate higher production or higher productivity. So uh, I'm pretty sure that the Koch brothers support my notion that we should, we should get rid of these, uh, all these tax subsidies and, and let the markets decide this. By the way, this is a problem just in general on our tax code. I don't have any of these tax expenditures there are. But whenever there's a, 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 a challenge or an opportunity or someone feels like you know, we need to accelerate a good idea, the natural tendency is to go to the tax code and provide a credit or a deduction or an acceleration or a you know, depletion allowance or whatever. And uh, that's not, it creates so much complication that we become more subservient to Washington, D.C. Every time you eliminate credits and deductions and all these things and lower rates, you're taking power away from that corridor between Dulles Airport and Washington, D.C., where it's the most prosperous place in America. I mean, people are living large in Washington, D.C. Median income is up, housing prices are great, unemployment is non-existent. And it's because we keep giving our own power to Washington, and the tax code and regulations are the two places where that's the most prevalent. Hey, Governor, we have time for one last question. Oh, we got two, because I, I have a tradition in my town meetings. 